Well, I'd like you this morning, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation 13. We're going to read from verse 11 uh, down to verse 18, and we're going to meet the false prophet this morning. And so we trust the Lord will uh, help us as we study this together. Verse 11 says this, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. And so as we're introduced to this second beast, the, what we would call the religious beast, remember the first beast was the political beast that we saw in verses one through ten. This individual we're going to see is called elsewhere the false prophet. And as we consider him, uh, first of all, notice John says, and I beheld another beast come up out of the earth. Now, it's kind of interesting that the word another here um, is the word alos. It's a, a, another of a different kind. And yet the word beast is the same word that's used in verse uh, verse one. And so there's differences and yet they're still wild beasts, both of them. Uh, the word beast is used, and we said it's distinct from the living creatures in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, and uh, speaks of wild beasts. But there's distinctions and there's similarities. And so one of the distinctions is uh, they're, where they're from. So it tells us here that this one uh, came uh, he says in verse 11, another beast coming up out of the earth, in contrast to the first beast uh, that we saw rising out of the sea. And so clearly a distinction there. And we did mention that the first beast, we believe, from the west, from around the area of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, out of the troubled sea of the Gentiles, this ruler will come. We said that didn't uh, rule out the idea that he could still be Jewish, but he will his kingdom will come out of that area where historically the kingdoms in Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7 have come from on that great Mediterranean Sea area. On the other hand, this beast comes from the earth. And of course, this word earth, uh, it's used uh, numerous times in the New Testament. And actually, not exclusively, but on numerous occasions, it's used of the land of Israel. It's called the land of Israel. So uh, same word is used uh, for the land of Israel is used here. So many suspect because the first guy is coming out of the nations that the contrast is this man is coming from the land of Israel. And so he says, I saw this another beast. And again, someone like the beast rising from the sea, because, because we said the same word beast is used, but very different, different in origin. One comes out of the sea, the other out of the earth different in rank because uh, the second is subordinate to the first. In fact, we'll see that he causes all that are on the earth to worship the first beast. We see that in verse 12. It says, he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, 
And so it seems like he's in a subordinate role, and his role is to cause the worship of the first beast, uh, to direct people to worship the first beast. So subordinate, uh, different in origin, different in rank, subordinate to the first. Also different in appearance, because we saw the description of the beast that came out of the sea, and of course we got this uh, this idea of the horns and ten crowns and uh, seven heads and all the rest of it. So we got quite a description. And here, this beast is lamb-like in appearance. Uh, he says he had two horns like a lamb, but then it says he spoke as a dragon. So very different in appearance because of this lamb-like appearance. His title is the false prophet. Now, we don't get this in this little section here, but it's very evident elsewhere that he has given that title. And let's just look at where that false prophet title comes from. Let's look at chapter 16 and verse 13. It says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And so these three, this satanic trinity mentioned together, chapter 19 and verse 20, which I think is even more specific. And he says, and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And as we look further down our passage in chapter 13, we'll see that this description of this second beast is that he's going to do miracles and he is also going to compel men to take the mark of the beast. And so clearly this individual is the one who is known as the false prophet. And then chapter 20 and verse 10, we see again, the devil that deceiveth them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so we see the satanic trinity and their demise and their casting into the lake of fire. So he's also known, as we said, as well as this idea of this second beast or religious beast, he is what we call the false prophet. Also, that would suggest to us his Jewish origin, uh, because certainly the Jews have had their share of prophets down through the centuries, and he is going to come as a false prophet to bring great deception, particularly in the land of Israel, but throughout the whole world. It, it's thought that he will be the fin final Jewish religious leader who will direct worship to the dragon and to the beast. He doesn't claim messiahship for himself, but he claims it for the beast, who we have suggested is the, the Antichrist. We've said that because he is the one that has that deadly wound by a sword and did live. And so this pseudo death and resurrection, uh, showing him to be uh, this idea of a false or imposter Christ. And so he directs all worship to him and to the dragon as well. So the whole objective of the false prophet is to, to bring glory to the beast. That's why some have seen him uh, in terms of the satanic trinity as the anti-Holy Spirit. You know how the Holy Spirit directs us to the Son. Uh, he wants us to focus on the Lord Jesus. He, he shall glorify me. Well, in the very same way that the Holy Spirit glorifies the Lord Jesus and focuses our attention toward the Lord Jesus, this, uh, this false prophet, uh, this anti-Holy Spirit will direct a lot of attention uh, towards uh, the Antichrist and, as it were, compel people to worship him. So notice he talks about the fact that he's like a lamb. But on the other hand, he says uh, he, he looks like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. That's interesting, isn't it? How the Lord has consistently warned us and the apostles about wolves in sheep's clothing. Well, here we have a dragon-like individual, certainly in terms of his speech, 
who has the appearance of a lamb. And of course, uh, his speech betrays him. Just as Peter's speech betrayed him, uh, this man's speech betrays him. And of course, it's very evident that uh, as um, one that is speaking uh, like a dragon or as a dragon, well, how does the dragon speak? And let's go back and look at what the Lord Jesus says about how Satan speaks and what his conduct is. Back in John 8, verse 44, we read this. A year of your father, the devil, the loss of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And then John chapter 6 and verse 44, again, we see the same idea of lies and deception coming from Satan. Uh, John 6, 44, it says, no, that's not the right <laughs> reference. Maybe it's just 844 that I had in mind. Um, so men are going to be called upon uh, to believe a lie here. Uh, this man is a liar from the beginning, just as he speaks like the dragon, who was a liar from the very beginning. And so that's the, the idea. Out of his mouth is going to come utter deception and lies. Uh, he may look like a lamb, but as soon as he opens his mouth, the, uh, the voice of the dragon is going to come forward, calling men actually to believe the lie that will be so evident in the last days that this uh, this Antichrist, uh, this first beast, uh, is claiming to be God manifest in flesh. So we said his speech betrays him. He earns this title, the false prophet. And so with the dragon and the beast rising up from the sea and the beast rising from the, the land, we have this unholy trinity. Uh, the dragon is the antifather. The beast rising from the sea is the Antichrist, and the beast rising from the land is the anti-Holy Spirit. And notice his activity. So in verse 12, now it's just interesting, I want to notice something. Uh, there's In 12 and 13, we're going to see uh, in English different words, but in Greek it's exactly the same word. So the word, he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. That word, he exerciseth, that's one Greek word. Verse uh, again, verse 12, and causeth, that's again the same Greek word, it's the idea of to do. This is what the man does. Uh, and then the final one, again, verse 13, and he doeth great wonders. And so it's all the same word in the Greek language. And so what does he do? Well, he, first of all, exercises all the power of the first beast before him. And so everything he does... Uh, is kind of done in the authority of the first beast. Uh, he's doing it on his benefit, on his behalf, and 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 using his authority. The excise is the power of the first beast before him. He causes, uh, it says, the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And we did mention that in this sense, he is the counterfeit Holy Spirit, wants to direct all uh, glory, all honor to the first beast, just as the Spirit would desire all glory and all honor to be directed to Christ. Now, it may seem a fantastic thing to some that the world would be led into worship of a man and of the devil, because this is where it's all heading. It's, it's causing the world to worship the, the dragon, and this first beast. But by nature, men have an undeniable religious impulse, and they also have an undeniable rebellion against God. So what men want most is not the elimination of religion. <laughs> they don't want to get rid of religion, but they want their own religion. Uh, they want the kingdom, but they don't want God to be part of it, the true God of revelation. And so we see man's religious impulse finding it a, a definite outlet in the last days. And we will see uh, that uh, they're going to show this impulse, but as well, it will show their undeniable rebellion against God. It tells us that he does 
great wonders in verse 13, so that uh, he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So again, we've said um, he has the same authority as the first beast. It's from the same source. They're acting not in competition, but in cooperation. And the power uh, comes from the dragon. The same power that excises the first beast will excise this second beast. It will be dragon power that is used here. And we've already said he's directing worship to the first beast. And you can't help but look back in history. Uh, you see, for instance, in the, uh, the Third Reich and the time of Hitler, that Joseph Goebbels, he played the role of the chief minister of propaganda, and his purpose was always to make Hitler, as it were, the, the anti-Messiah, look good. And so this, this end-time false prophet is going to be just like that. He's going to be the chief minister of propaganda and lies and deception, because, again, he's speaking like the dragon, who was a liar from the very beginning, and he's directing all attention towards this first beast. And what he uses is wonders, miracles, as a means of this deception. And, of course, we understand that, for instance, the Jews... Uh, the Pharisees were constantly asking the Lord for a sign. Show us a sign to prove who you are. First um, Corinthians one twenty two talks about the Jews require a sign, and so how is he going to persuade Israel that this is this false prophet? How is he going to persuade Israel that this man is the Messiah? Well, going to be signs that will be connected with it, and one of the signs is fire from heaven the sign that authenticated Elijah as the prophet of God will be repeated in this false prophet. It says that he has power to call fire, fire down from heaven. And so to the earth, in the sight of men, men will witness this, they'll see this. And so it's important that uh, John is highlighting this miracle. In the eyes of the deceived world, it's going to answer the miracle of the two witnesses. Remember that one of them was Elijah-like, you know, chapter 11 and verse 15. It says, um, chapter 11, verse 5, sorry. It says, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, they must in this manner be killed. And so obviously important that he can do the same kind of miracle, calling fire down from heaven. And so he answers the miracle of the two witnesses who minister during this the period of, and are persecuted by the, the Antichrist and his false prophet. And in order to deceive the world, he, he has to be able to do the same thing. And so he, he puts this... Uh, false prophet kind of Elijah-like, uh, let the true God answer with fire. Remember when he uh, Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, 1 Kings 18, 24, let the God, the true God answer by fire. And so this is how he's able to do this. Notice also um, part of this miraculous deception, he calls down this fire from heaven and and to the earth and the sight of men. And what's the purpose behind it? Well, verse 14, again, the purpose is deception. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now, again, I want you just to see a lot of counterfeits in this chapter. So we've already seen the counterfeit Holy Spirit, this man directing all attention to the first beast. Now we see uh, the second counterfeit, the counterfeit resurrection. We've already looked at it when we considered uh, the first beast, but all uh, kind of attention drawn to him that had the wound by a sword and did live. So we've got this idea of a counterfeit, counterfeit re uh, resurrection. And we, we need to just maybe say this, that, and it's in, maybe it's, it's particularly important in the day in which we live, that there's always been a devilish 
supernaturalism in the world. In fact, um, often the, the counterfeit satanic supernaturalism has run alongside divine supernatural power that is seen on the earth. So for instance, in the days of Exodus, in particular chapters 7 through 9, as Aaron performed miracles, up to a point, those miracles were matched by the magicians of Egypt. There was They were able to do miracles on a par in those first chapters. Now, they got to a point where they couldn't, and they, they acknowledged this is the finger of God. But I want us to see that they were capable of doing the miraculous uh, in in the early part of those chapters and and scripture always assumes that i want you to look at deuteronomy 13 this is a very important chapter about warning against false prophets and we just want to break in verse one we'll read the first five verses and we'll see what the warning is and it's a very important warning so it says in deuteronomy 13 if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. So again, the assumption is that there is a supernatural power that can be from a false source, from a satanic source. And the sign or wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. So clearly, this is not a prophet of God. He's taking people away from the true God. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or the, that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you, was putting you to the test, to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and cleave unto him, and the prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he hath spoken to you to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put away the evil from the midst of thee. So I want you just to see the simple point is this. God is saying there will be supernatural works done on behalf of false prophets. And, and the goal is to pull people away from the true and living God. And he warns people to judge a worker of miracles by their message, not just by their works. Okay, that's a very important principle. Judge them by their message, not just by the works. So this man does miracles, and he even in appearance is lamb-like. Okay, so you can see that there's there's a lot of things that that would be very deceptive here. But how do you test him? By the speech, right? He, he his mouth is like the mouth of a dragon. And so it's his speech is what you've got to watch for. And it is interesting, isn't it? When, when Jacob um, deceived Isaac, it's kind of interesting that uh, the various senses that were involved, uh, he felt like a hairy man. He smelt like a man of the field. And the one thing that he says, but the voice is the voice of Jacob. <laughs> And yet he went by the other feelings rather than by the, the voice. And, and again, God wants to warn us here. What is, what is the man's message, not what miracles he appears to be doing? Look at the New Testament now, just again, just to see this, that we should expect that there could be the miraculous, but it's no guarantee that it is from God. Matthew, uh, sorry, Matthew 7, uh, verses 22 and 23. Matthew 7, verse 22 and 23. Let me read these words. It says, but Jesus said unto, that's chapter 8, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, 
and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, isn't that interesting? Done many works, uh, miraculous things, um, prophesied in his name, cast out devils, done many wonderful works. And he says, I never knew you. And, and so, again, we just need to recognize that there is a supernaturalism that's out there in the world that is not from God. <clears throat> and so uh, the Lord Jesus, again, in Matthew 24, warned us about these false prophets who are going to come in the last days, Matthew 24 and verse 24. where we read this for there shall arise false christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible they should deceive the very elect so you can see very convincing right that's the idea and and very dangerous and so the lord is warning us and again the final reference i want us to look at just as we uh, consider this aspect of this study, Second Thessalonians chapter two. Second Thessalonians two, and we'll look at verse nine. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse nine. It says, um, "Well, let's read from verse eight. Um, no, let's go to verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth or restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy at the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And so, again, now we see where this supernatural power is coming from. It's coming from the dragon, right? It's coming from Satan, uh, all power and signs and lying wonders. Obviously, there's some deception uh, clearly in them, lying wonders. And so, knowing all this and emphasizing on sign and wonders, today, it's very interesting, isn't it, that a lot of what we would call Chris, Christendom, whatever you want to call it, there's a fascination with signs and wonders, signs and wonders movement. And it's it's quite um, alarming. And, and so uh, some may be deceived to say, well, you can really know where God is, is and where his power is by the signs and wonders. That could lead a person to great deception. Because, again, the question is, what is the message? Not the miracle. What is the message that this prophet brings? And, again, we see here that the message that this one brings. He's like a lamb, but he spake as a lion. So notice, again, verse 14. It says, back in chapter 13, verse 14, it says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth the earth dwellers, by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, again, the earth dwellers, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So his suggestion is what we need to do in the light of this man's apparent resurrection, <laughs> is we need to build an image to him. Uh, we need to make an image. And doesn't that remind you, it's kind of interesting, that the times of the Gentiles began in Daniel chapter 3 by the making of an image and by compelling men to bow down and worship it. And here we have the the times of the Gentiles coming to their very end. And what is going to happen? Well, there's going to be the making of an image, and there's going to be a compulsion for men once again to worship it on pain of death. And it will be a day 
of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> there will be those that will go into the fire rather than uh, obey uh, the compulsion to worship this image. And it will be a time of tremendous persecution. And so, again, just interesting how this times the Gentiles, the two bookends, uh, this, this idea of an image. Now, notice again, verse 15, he had power to give life onto the image of the beast. Now, here's a very interesting thing. So we've had a counterfeit Holy Spirit in this chapter. We've had a counterfeit resurrection. And now we're going to have counterfeit creation. And it says he's power to give life. Now, the word life there um, is the word that sometimes is translated breath. Sometimes it's translated spirit. And many believe that this image will basically be moved and empowered by an evil spirit, an unclean spirit. Because no one can give life but God. He alone is the creator. But uh, this image could easily become, uh, as it were, possessed by something demonic. And it's just interesting that there's a lot of discussion right now, and don't want to go into that too much, about artificial intelligence. And one of the concerns is the 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 fact that there then well, there's a lot of talk about it being intelligence given by aliens and all the rest of it, and and that these machines could be at some point possessed uh, by these beings. And uh, again, I, it wouldn't surprise me if this is exactly what's going to happen, that this image, uh, we know how creative man is now in making uh, these images that look like real people. Uh, and uh, But this one uh, has, unlike the idols of the Old Testament, where God says, you know, they, they don't speak, they don't move, they don't, you know, they have to be carried, all a lot of ridicule of idolatry in the Old Testament, this particular image is going to be able to move and articulate and uh, will not need to be carried. Uh, it will seem that it is alive. And so it says, he has power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast shall be killed. So this image is what we know elsewhere as the abomination of desolation that will be set up in the holy place. And of course, um, we, we know that when, when this is seen, the message is when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, flee. This is the time to get out. This is the time to move. And so we see, for instance, in chapter 12, verse 14, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. And again, is, is this fleeing in connection with this image that is set up? Because again, Jews may be lots of things, but they're not idolaters. They've been cured of idolatry in Babylon. And when they see this, I believe many of them will flee. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. We've looked at this numerous times as we have studied uh, Revelation together. But in verse 15, uh, Matthew 24, verse 15, it says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let them which is in the housetop not come down to make anything out of to take anything out of the house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Pray ye that your flight be not in the winter nor in the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, which was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, nor ever shall be. And except those days be shortened, that there should be no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So again, this 
clearly this abomination of desolation. It's the signal to flee. And notice the Jewish language there. If it's on a Sabbath and all the rest of it, if those in Judea are on the housetop, it's an abomination in the sense that it's the supreme idolatry. And it's a desolation in the sense that it will bring the judgment described in Revelation chapter 16. And uh, the, the, the judgments of God will fall because of this ultimate act of human idolatry. And again, it may seem strange to us to have the whole world give this kind of worship to the image of a man. But again, we look at the personality cults of totalitarian regimes uh, in the 20th century, and we can see how easily this could occur. Uh, you see uh, totalitarian, totalitarian states like the Soviet Union, North Korea, communist China, and their omnipresent pictures of Stalin and Mao and the leaders of their nation. We saw something like that in Nazi Germany, the idolatry and worship basically given to a man. And certainly we'll see that this pattern will ultimately be fulfilled in this last day's uh, beast out of the sea. By the way, uh, the things that I'm saying is not a recent understanding of this passage. The first known commentary that we have on the book of Revelation was written by a man called Victorinus in the early church. And this is what he says. This is his comment on Revelation 13, verse 15. He says, he shall cause all that, he shall cause also, sorry, he shall cause also that a golden image of Antichrist shall be placed in the temple at Jerusalem and the apostate angel should enter and thence utter voices and oracles. So even in the early church, they had this conviction that this is going to happen and it's going to be set up in the temple at Jerusalem and that uh, uh, this apostate angel would enter and utter voices and oracles. So verse 16, he says, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. I just wonder, it's maybe not, don't want to be dogmatic about it, but I wonder if the, the most ardent followers of the beast will say, I want it on my forehead. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I absolutely, I'm so thankful for this great person that has brought uh, this world into a new age, you know, and so they'll, they'll want it plastered on their forehead. Uh, the maybe some that are, you know, they're doing it because hey, we got to buy and sell. And so they'll get it on their, uh, their right arm. So uh, that's just a thought, but it, I don't want to be dogmatic, but a, a mark on their right hand on their foreheads. And again, Notice that Satan is not very creative. All he can do is imitate God. So it's kind of a parody, isn't it? Satanic parody of what God has already uh, done to his uh, sealed ones in chapter 7. If you remember, in verse 3, it says, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And of course, then he conceals 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so, again, just that idea of he, he's, he's no new ideas. He's always copying, counterfeiting the Trinity, counterfeiting the resurrection, and now counterfeiting the seal on the servants of God written in their, on their foreheads. And so this is the idea. He's, he, he, all the world will be compelled to do this. Now, how, how will this compulsion work? Well, it'll be three things. On the one hand, it'll be the miraculous signs will cause people to be persuaded. This really is God doing something. And so they're, they're going to be deceived by the miraculous signs. But also those that are more skeptical, well, 
the threat of death may also, I mean, you know, kind of cause them to take it. Because he says, again, in verse 15, he had power to give life to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And so rather than die, hey, I'm going to take the mark. And so on the one hand, miraculous signs. On the other hand, death threats. And here's another one that is a powerful thing. It'll be enforced by financial controls. Look at verse 16 and 17. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so clearly, part of it is going to be financial controls. Again, I want to just suggest to you that we won't see the beast. We we saw in 2 Thessalonians 2, the restrainer must be removed before the man of sin can be revealed. But it doesn't mean that we will not see the beast system falling into place. And I think we're already seeing the power of financial control. Uh, where we're moving at a very fast rate uh, towards uh, what we call social credit scores that will determine if you're not environmentally friendly, if you're not gay friendly, if you're not this or that, then then you're you're a bad credit and uh, you can't get a loan. You can't do this. And so already control is being exercised or at least attempts to bring this in right now. And so it's it's going to move towards this. I'm not saying that that's exactly it. And I and again, let me just say this. I don't believe that anybody will knowingly take the mark of the beast without realizing its connection with the worship of the beast. Because they know what they're doing. And so you can't accidentally get it. <laughs> don't worry about that. It would be something deliberately taken. But notice again, as he talks about this, he says, no man might buy or sell save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. I want to just think about the number of his name here. He's going to tell us the number is 603 score and 6, 666. It costs a lot of interesting thoughts on that. But um, the number of his name was a common concept in the ancient world, both in Greek and in Hebrew as well, letters were assigned a numerical value such as a equals one b equals two and so forth now again we're talking greek language and hebrew language here i'm just using that by way of illustration and so on so for example um in the ruins of pompeii there was graffiti on a wall and it said this i love her whose number is 545. Five. Now, I didn't mean I love her who lives at number 545 Main Street, Pompeii. What it meant was he was using the number connected with the letters of her name, 545. Five. Now, again, I don't know what that translates. I have no idea. But but again, just to show that this, this was a common idea. So he says in verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. So 666 is the number of the beast. And notice he says as well, it's the number of a man. And of course, man was, six is associated, isn't it, with man as created on the sixth day. Triple six would indicate man at his best or at his height of power yet still short of the perfection that's found in number seven, <laughs> being the perfect number. So could it be that what we're going to see in this beast system with the, the man of sin and with the false prophet is man in three spheres dominating, Man at his, his height dominate in three spheres. He will dominate religion. Because at that time, the main religion will be worshipping this image of this man who had the deadly wound and lived. So he'll dominate religious life. He'll dominate 
political life. He's going to be the dominant world ruler. No, not much competition, certainly no free elections. And he will dominate commercial life. You will not be able to buy or sell. And it is interesting that when you get this combination of political and commercial, just as we're seeing here in, for instance, in the US, the censorship that's just clearly taking place by big tech, the commercial life that is tied in with the political life. And we can see it already. And so all of these things, religion, politics, commerce, will all come together under this, all spheres of life will be controlled by this cruel, despotic ruler and his false prophet. Now, it's interesting. Uh, there's an imperative here. Uh, here is wisdom. Wisdom. Let him that understand count the number of the beast. And, and so the idea of this thought of counting <laughs> um, uh, would, would say to people uh, and justify in the minds of many the, the mathematical attempts to unravel the enigma of this number. Now, I want to just talk about this for a minute. The art of linking letters and numbers, we've already said, it's, it's very common. It was called by the Jewish rabbis, and I learned a new word this week, so here's my new word, gematria, G-E-M-A-T-R-I-A, -A, is what we call, Jewish rabbis call linking letters and numbers. And it was endlessly applied by the rabbis to the Old Testament scriptures, searching for hidden messages and meanings. Assigning numerical values to letters of the alphabet is normal in Hebrew, Greek, and in Latin. Many have amused themselves with numbers endlessly and to little profit. Because virtually everyone imaginable has been suggested to be this 666 number of the beast. So far, we have the Pope and Luther and Calvin, and Napoleon, and Kaiser Wilhelm, and Hitler, and Mussolini, and Stalin, and Kissinger, just to name a few who have been suggested to be this man of sin. It's very evident we don't know who he is. But this idea of wisdom, in the end times, the wise will understand the daniel chapter 12 and verse 10 i believe it tells us it says many shall be purified and made white and tried but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand and from that time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that make of death set up. So at that time, people will have wisdom to, to recognize who this person is. They'll know it and there'll be no question concerning it. So what I want to do just in the minutes that remain is do a little comparison between Christ and Antichrist. We've based on this chapter 13 and other places, we see that the true Christ humbled himself, coming to serve and to save. He was the servant. He was the savior. Antichrist comes to exalt himself, and he comes to domineer and destroy. Christ comes to do his father's will. Antichrist comes to do Satan's will. Christ wrought miracles in the power of the Holy Spirit. Antichrist will do miracles by satanic power and by this false prophet. Christ is holy, pure, and righteous. The Antichrist is the man of sin or the man of lawlessness. Christ was and is the Lamb of God, and Antichrist will be a wild beast. So, tremendous difference between the two and so we we see that this is coming now again we recognize that and believe that as the church of the lord jesus we will not be here to see 
these individuals take their place. But it doesn't mean that they're not alive right now. They could well be. And it doesn't mean they just haven't been revealed to mankind. And it's certainly we can see as globalism and all these things are moving forward that the beast system is beginning to be set up ready for this moment. And that means that there's a certain urgency on our part to tell people about the true Christ, the one who came to seek and to save that which is lost and all oh, how we must be diligent in getting the message out while there's still time and before this great deception comes with this one who looks lamb-like but has the mouth and speaks as a dragon or oh, how we need to preach the true message of the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world amen